we were achieving success on a scale that really we didn't imagine. Yeah. I wanted to, to be in a band with my best mate. I mean, it's just the best story ever. It's incredible. And then world domination. It's crazy. An act had dropped out and we got the call from Top of the Pops. There were sort of seminal moments along the way, but it was our first sort of exposure to the public en masse and um, made a big impression. Yeah. I'd written a note for my mum on my bedroom door, which I'd made a spelling mistake and I'd put wake me up up before you I thought, go go yeah and George saw that and then about a day later in the studio and he said come and listen Check to this I was like holy smoke cool. that is a number yeah. one George had been backed into a bit of a corner he really disliked bad boys he disliked having to write it to formula club Tropicana liberated us from all of that we played last Christmas at uh, Wembley on Christmas at, at Eve. At Wembley on Christmas Eve, which was, which was I mean, that gives me goosebumps even thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it was quite something. It shows the strength of your friendship, really, truly, that you could both sit down and agree that at, at its biggest, at its most successful, that you were going to call it a day. That was one of the few points of friction between us because I felt that we, we owed an obligation to our worldwide audience to, to, to say goodbye to, to it. But for him to develop, as I said, as an artist, he couldn't do that within the constraints of Wham. And we, we knew that Wham would have a finite lifespan because, because it, was, it represented our youth, because it was all about that energy and vitality of youth. Andrew, it's a great honor for me to, to spend time with you and talk about uh, Wham and the early days of the band and being a big fan of, of Wham, of, of what you guys did. I mean, I, I personally, I believe I'm a singer today because of the music, of what you guys gave me um, at a young age. Um, it's 40 years since, since the first single. Um, there's a fabulous Netflix documentary. You know, it, we're, we're getting to see things and hear things that we never knew about the band. And, and as a fan, that's really, it's really incredible. How does it feel for you to go back in and kind of go back to the start and talk about it so, all, you know, so freshly like you are now? Well, it's a privilege first and foremost, and, and um, it is very flattering that, that um, you, you know you, you say such nice things about uh, the, the influence that Wham uh, had on uh, on the very young Ronan Keaton. Yeah, very, very young, very young. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's been a process, uh, one that I've actually really enjoyed. Uh, they're, they're, they're sort of bittersweet moments, of course. You know, one, one can't uh, look back on uh, on my friendship with Jörg and, and uh, not reflect on, on his, his, uh, the fact that he's no longer with us. However, largely, it's been defined by, by uh, um, a real sense of affection and uh, not nostalgia, but just um, a, a warmth that mm. uh, uh, reviewing such, you know, it was such a great time. And, uh, and, and the strength of our friendship was <coughs> excuse me, was, was such that um, it, it was, it, it, it was, it's been a really nice process to sort of be a part of, to behold. So let's go back to 1981, um, was, was when you guys first kind of set out as a band. Um, is it right? Like, was 83 was the first kind of success, the first thing started uh, to happen? Well, it, it was 19, we formed the band in 1979, yeah. our school band, the executive. Well, what, what age are you now? You're 12, is that uh, right? No, no, we're 16 at this 16 point. at this yeah, stage, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you met at 12 years of age, George and yourself met at 12 at yeah, school in Bush. Yeah, he, he was the new boy, uh, introduced to um, my class, uh, 2A1. 2A1. Uh, we were so stupid out of school that, that we only had one A string. Yeah. And there were no B strings or C strings, it was A and D. Just A and D, right, that was me. Well, I was in the D class, unfortunately, so I feel your pain. Um, so, so he was the new boy yeah, in school? So he was the new boy, yeah. uh, and he was introduced to, to our class as, as Yorius Panayotu. Uh, which was it wasn't a bad attempt by our teacher, but um, it, 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 you know that wasn't uh, it wasn't quite how one pronounced pronounce his name, and uh, they, as with all new kids, they wanted a mentor for mm. him. So I put my hand up, and uh, and he was delivered unto me. It, it's amazing, like when you say that, you know, the choice you made. You put up your hand, and and you know. What happened after that? How the, you know how the universe works is is fascinating. You very much were you know you were starting a band and he was going to be in it and that was that. You two were you know were going to make music together. That's what. Yeah, was going I on. mean we 
what happened is it was a process. We, went, as our friendship developed, we uh, and we spent time with each other. And uh, he had a drum kit in his bedroom, and there were some other instruments. I think I mean, there might have been a guitar, a little keyboard, and we we do s pastiche radio shows, and uh, and we do we do scenes from films, we do jingles, and we take the rise out of DJs and whatnot. And um, and so we do these little tapes, and then. And then it, that sort of morphed into, well, you know, let, let's write songs. Um, but at the age of about 14, uh, and we were thinking about writing songs, maybe forming a band, and he was very much, uh, he, there was a lot of pressure on him to succeed academically, and therefore um, he, he felt that it would have to be after the O-levels, which okay. we'd take at 16. Mm -hmm. After the O-levels, the same thing happened, it was after the A-levels, and at that point, I thought, Christ, you know, this is never going to happen. <laughs> never going to happen, precisely. So, so yeah. I, I grasped the nettle, and um, it was November '79, and I, I was barely at, at sit form um, ever. And my, um, I saw my form teacher in the morning, and I said, "Look, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave school." And she said, "That's just as well because we were going to ask you to." Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. And I thought, yeah, but I beat you to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I phoned up Casio, got a place, and phoned Yog and said, look, we're forming a band now. Uh, it's, it's today, it's now That's or it. never. And um, yeah, I mean, he, and he, he folded. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I think we rehearsed, not that evening, but short, shortly thereafter. Yeah. So yeah, and so we, we wrote songs and we did a few gigs. Uh, and then the, the executive imploded. And, um, and we were left with, we don't know anyone else who can play instruments, yeah. so it was just the two of us. Because at the time it was. Well, well we're we're here in Soho. This is, well, this is now called a B at One, but this this is actually one of the first clubs that you, that well, that you guys used to come and perform at and, and and well hang out in. It was called the Beetroot. Yeah, it yeah. was the Beetroot. It was an infamous. Well, no, it was a famous club. You know, it was a very much a one of the clubs that was um, part of the the new romantic scene right. in in London at that time. We weren't really part of that. Um, that that because we were. Uh, that was very much, I think, tied into some of the art colleges and. Uh, um, and but we we'd come here. Um, we'd come into town and we'd go disco dancing. Um, and and the beat route was one of the places that that uh, we used to like to come because the 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 music that uh, the beat route played and the whole new romantic scene was slightly distinct from from other clubs at the time. Right. And um, and so we used to come down here and, and of course a lot of the, the luminaries of the, the new romantic scene, one would see Steve Strange and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Spandau Boys um, wow. and, and yeah and, and uh, I think Boy George probably fit the salon, all, the, all those guys that there's the stalwarts of, uh, of the new romantic scene. Um, and yeah and we'd, we'd, uh, we'd be doing the new romantic sort of dance yeah. moves, which actually developed, evolved to become part of our um, presentation. Your thing, your thing, your stick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> stick. So, so first single, um, you start writing, you start performing, uh, you're trying to get a deal and so on. It doesn't really happen immediately for you. It takes a bit of time. Yeah, so we, we, we demoed the yeah. three tracks, Ram Rap, Young, uh, Club of Bacana and, uh, and Careless Swiss, but only it was the only track that was fully worked up was Wham Rap. It was about two verses in the chorus of um, Club Tropping, and it was a verse in the chorus of Careless Whisper. And we thought that was enough. I mean, it was enough in the end. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, i not quite sure in what world we were, we were living, you know, to, 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 to think that that was going to swing any record company exec. Mm. But eventually, I gave this demo, managed to get the demo to Mark, Mark Dean, and... Um, we, I badgered him endlessly <laughs> for a response. <laughs> he was trying to avoid me. I think eventually he listened to it. His mum made him listen to it <laughs> because she was, she was friendly with my mum, Dad. Oh. And, uh, and, um, and then we got a call and he said, um, will you and Yog meet me up at the, uh, the Three Crowns? And uh, I knew he was going to offer us a record deal at that point. And okay. uh, so we stepped through the door and he said, I'm going to offer you a record deal. 
and you know that was it. We 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 made it. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you think so, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so absolutely. you know, our, our aspirations, mm -hmm. you know, they 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 developed a lot along the way. Um, but at that point in time, to be offered a record deal was nirvana. Yeah. Did you have a definitive vision of what the band was going to be f from early, or did it evolve over time? Yeah. It it, it was an. It, you know, the band was only Yog and I. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't a band as such. Um, we, we, you know, it was a songwriting. Essentially, it was a songwriting partnership yeah. uh, initially that um, developed into into you know, what it was. Uh, and um, <laughs> probably needs rather better better explanation. Than that. No, but it's funny you say it was only Yog and I, or George uh, and yourself. It's incredible because what we all see is something. Totally different. This global, massive, international mega band, pop band, the biggest in the world, you know. And, and you know, you, you guys are just two school friends, uh, still twelve years of age, you know. I guess just looking at what could be, and and you know, it, it didn't happen. I know immediately, and it was a, it was a break on top of the pops that kind of things really started to happen. Yeah. So we had no way of presenting ourselves, mm. it's, uh, and so we uh, when we signed the deal, we we recorded Wham Rap and it was released and it, it, it didn't, it wasn't a hit. And so Innovision had us doing promo around doing PAs around mm. the clubs of London and, and, uh, and England. And we had to have some way of presenting it. And, and so what we did was, uh, Shirley was my girlfriend. And we, we adapted our beetroot moves and our um, Bogart moves, the B moves we used to call <laughs> We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and we we adapted those into into the routines, and and D, DC Lee joined us. We were able to to perform and present the tracks in a kind of a fairly novel way. Yeah. Not quite a band, not, you know, not quite a dance troupe, you know, somewhere in between. Yeah, the ultimate boy band. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> boy and girl band. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we had been doing these. P PAs mm. and a researcher from Saturday Superstore had seen us by all accounts and um, suggested we go on the show. So we went on Saturday Superstore and we got a big lift in, in, in the, the sales of Young Guns and it took us to number 42. But as you know, mm. I, unless you were a new entry in the top 40, top 40 yeah. you, you, didn't, you didn't get an automatic top of the pop spot. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were on the cusp and, and the sales weren't looking like they were going to push us into the top 40. But then an act had dropped out and we got the call from Top of the Pops. And that really was the, uh, there, were, there were sort of seminal moments along the way, but that really, when you consider Top of the Pops was, had an audience of upwards of 8 million or so. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and you know, as you know, the whole country, Watch all the pops, Stopped listen to, the to watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and so we we did that top of the pops performance. Um, well, Yog performed. I sort of loitered. Uh, <laughs> Stop! Stop it! No way! You see, that's the thing. You can't even say that. It's they're iconic. I know. I can see it <laughs> yeah. visually. Well, the funny thing is, we we. Uh, it was so miserable doing Top of the Pops. Yeah. As you, as the <laughs> longest days. I mean, the longest days. Elstra, was it in Elstree at the time? No, it was... Uh, TV studios. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was TV studios. So by the time I got to it, it was, it was out yeah. in Elstree. Yeah. But I'm sure I it was mean, the same. You had to get up even earlier. Oh, my God. Is that when you moved down to Michigan? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm close to it. <laughs> now they don't have it anymore. What, but you'd be there at 8 or 9 in the morning, oh. and you'd wait all day long for your rehearsal slot. Then you'd yeah. wait all day long for them to record. Yeah, by the time we went on stage, I really wasn't in any mood to yeah. perform. But fortunately, uh, Yog was a bit more pro and, uh, and turned it on. So, But it was... As you, it was our first sort of exposure to the public en masse and um, made a big impression. Yeah. Um, and Literally it, the next day. It yeah. Began. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, Young Guns went to, to number three. Um, like what a huge a jump outside weeks. the 40 up to number three in a yeah. couple of weeks. Yeah, well, I mean, that shows the power, the power of, of, top of Top of the Pops on television yeah. at that yeah. time. We followed up Young Guns with, um, with Bad Boys and we, we didn't. We uh, we had obviously Club Trop and, and um, Careless Whisper, but but the time wasn't right for either of those, and we didn't really know how Careless Whisper was going to fit in ever. To yeah. be honest, it, it was kind of it was a song that sat slightly outside the whole Wham um, 
character and personality. Yeah. He wrote Bad Boys, which he hated, um, because he because he felt he was he was um, backed into not but he had to write a formula. He was okay. he, he wanted to follow up on on Young Guns in the same kind of style. It was I mean it was a it was a it was the right thing to do because it's what people expected and and, and at that point in time we didn't have anything else but we had to have a, a single to follow up uh, and, and make uh, it had to be a hit single yeah. because wham rat hadn't been a hit single and there were no other songs mm. Mm. <laughs> you know? is, it's incredible though you yeah. know there wasn't a body of work there wasn't no, an no. album no i mean but he, he kind of always wrote like that he um he wrote in the studio under pressure made it expensive but uh, yeah. but that's yeah. how he wrote he wrote um uh make it big much the same way um but um at that point in time, you know, Bad Boys was a big hit. I think it was number two. And then we re-released Wham Rap, went to number eight. Um, by that time, we'd, we were also becoming a hit in um, Japan, yeah. Australia. And, and, and so the international... Uh, it was starting to grow. It was starting to grow, yeah. Club Tropicana. I mean, iconic, iconic record. Um, 12-inch version. We played on Magic all the time. Um, so there's the intro, car door closing. Crunching of the stones. Yeah, yeah. Talk me through all of that. that I mean, that, that's it takes it takes guts to do something like that, and and people accept it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has. You're right. Yeah. It becomes it is iconic. In fact, you know, from the moment those cicadas start, yeah, um, pe people, you know, you know what it is. Intro, away. Yeah, people know what it it's is. It's summer. It, we we record. We was one of the first tracks we recorded, and we we um, when we recorded it in the studio. Uh, it, because it's so, it's visually so rich, and um, I, I suggested that we add sound effects because of its its sort of tropical um, Holiday flavor to feel. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just it, it suggests so much about you know holidays mm. and, and and beach clubs and that sort of vibe. So. We, I, yeah, I spent a day in uh, in the sound library selecting Set the sounds. Se so that's not you guys. No, no. No, no. I thought I thought I thought you yeah, were a great so form of a little recorder. Yeah, going no, up and down the so drive. The, 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 the car is a is a 1968 or 1969 MGB GT. Oh wow, that is the yep. car. There you go. Um, and so yeah, and so we put together the we recorded the sound effects uh, and, and put them together to to, to create. To create more than yeah, you know, it's more than just a record. It's a, it's a, it's a um, it's an experience, yeah. and that that's I think that's what with the cicadas we wanted to, to convey that 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 the full set, the full the immersion atmosphere. yeah atmosphere yeah and and, and so uh, and that's you know lent the video it gave gave the video a real sort mm. of a form to to uh, uh, to to hang on, and yeah the it, club top is excuse me, a, a brand in itself almost. It's so iconic. Yeah. And what it did was, as I said, Yog had been backed into a bit of a corner. He really disliked Bad Boys. You know, it's a great track, and but he disliked having to write it to... Um, formula. To formula, almost, yeah. 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 Quite and, and and the lyric was a little bit artificial. And it wasn't authentic us, you know, but that time we, we were already a hit band. Yeah. Club Tropicana liberated us from all of that. Uh, it, and, and so that was our first, that really unveiled Wham in its purest form, gotcha. you know. Yeah. Um, the girls looked unbelievable yeah, and, and we, look, we look pretty good, to be honest. <laughs> you do, you do, it was very cool. <laughs> so we're here in what used to be called the, the Beat Root Club. Mm. Did that inspire Club Tropicana? Yeah, it, it was the inspiration for the lyric of Club Tropicana. It was. Yeah, so Club Tropicana... Well, the drink's free. Uh, they, regrettably, they were not. No, no. They were pretty cheap, though, yeah, back yeah. in those days. The lyric of Club Tropicana is a slightly wry, tongue-in-cheek take on on London, okay. on the London club scene, okay. and, and and the 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 escapism of it. So we, you know that I think there used to be palm trees and whatnot in here. I and, and I can picture it. Really. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and so we we we. We kind of adapted that and, and brought in, you know, the, the, the holiday element into it as well as as, as uh, sending up a little bit the because yeah. the, it was quite a serious business that the new romantic scene mm -hmm. and and, uh, and so we were sending up a little bit, so a little bit tongue in cheek yeah. and uh, but yeah, it was this place that. that well, I, th I think that. you did t tongue in cheek well in Wham. 
I think you did. I think it was something, you know, even like if we're talking about the last Christmas video, you know, it's incredibly tongue in cheek, but very serious and beautiful and iconic. Definitely. I think that was something about Wham though. They, you didn't take yourself too seriously, but you were incredibly serious as an act. Yeah, the, the, the music was serious. Yes. Uh, yeah. Making good records and writing yeah. great songs. That was a serious business. Presentation of it and us. Which is the whole charm, which is the brilliance of it all. Then we had to write, we, we had to write, you had to write a follow up. And we were in the studio at Psalm West and we were recording a track called Wham Shake, which, which was okay, you know, it's kind of, yeah, it, it's got potential. It just sick. never, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. You know, it was one of those on the cast, but mm. it just wasn't great. Mm. It just wasn't great. Yeah. So, I, we were doing promo and whatnot, and I'd written a note for my mum on my bedroom door, which I'd made a spelling mistake, and I'd put, wake me up up before you, I thought, go, go. Yeah. And Yog saw that. And then about a day later in the studio, and he said, <laughs> come and listen Check to this. Out. Is a holy smoke. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's remarkable. <laughs> that is a number yeah. one. Uh, and, and so that was, the, and that was written just, we didn't have, he didn't, we had no other song where we had Ram Shake, but mm. the, nothing else. And then. That, and that's when it all happened, really, you know? We, we have those images of the Choose Life shirts, which you chose, right? Uh, I think you were very the, much on the fashion, I believe. Yeah, you know, the, you, you, that whole sort of, you know, the, the, the boxing boots and. Yeah. <laughs> That was, yeah, that was um, a, 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 an evolution of the kind of the sports thing, the Club Tropicana and yeah. the, the whole Club Fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our band must have, I hope they forgive well, they will never forgive me. And I don't blame them actually, because we dressed them up in, in the in Shocking. The feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it became uh, very, very cool and very uh, fashionable. Well, feeling. I mean, so, so, yeah, I mean, some, of, some of the kit was really yeah. quite stylish, but to make the band, you know, grown men, serious musicians wear shorts. Yeah. And, Sports where it's not on. I was, you know, you were, you were forward thinkers. That's what it was. <laughs> oh, Ahead of your time. That's what it was. Always, always. Um, <sighs> and it was our first number one. First number one. And then very much, very quickly then after that, you became a global band. I mean, international. I mean, we're, we're talking American, American tours, sellout tours, yeah. stadium tours. Um, China, obviously, which was huge, a huge press um, uh, thing, as well as you know, you've been the first Western band to perform in China. It was, it was a huge deal. Yeah, so Wake Me Up happened to be our, our first number one in the UK, but it was also a number one in the States. Yeah. And that really... Elevated um, you yeah, everywhere. Yeah, boosted our, our mm. profile in the States. And then Make It Big uh, became a number one in the States as well. And so we toured um, in, the, in the winter of 84. We, we, did, we did a world tour. We went to uh, tour in the UK. We, we, we played Wembley, had six nights at Wembley. We played on Christmas Eve. Wow, okay, wow. Yeah, yeah. And we may have played on Boxing Day as well, because I know that, I remember they added a date. Yeah. So we, yeah, I think we might have had Christmas Day off, but, I mean, and so we played, you know, we played last Christmas. At uh, Wembley on Christmas at, Eve. At Wembley on Christmas Eve, which, which was. Brilliant. I mean, that gives me goosebumps even thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was quite, it was quite something. The first record I ever bought, I begged my mother on the street in Dublin, on Henry Street, for this single called Last Christmas. It was, it was, uh, it was everything to me. I, it was the first record I ever bought. I, it was wow. 99 pence. My mum gave me a punt, an Irish the, punt. Discounted. Well, in Ireland, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we hadn't got much. Um, so it came, um, I remember going into the record store, I think it was called Golden Discs on Henry Street, and I bought it, and I came out, and I, I remember, I remember just the elation, the joy. There's a famous quote, I don't know if it's true, that he said, George said to you, I've, I've written a Christmas number one, which is, I mean, it's brilliant. Is it true? Yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, he did. He did say, uh, I've written, it was autumn of 84, um, and we were around at his mum and dad's house. Uh, legendarily, you, you'll know that, with, that Wham had one of the worst record deals in, in the history of, uh, of the music business. Mm. And so we didn't have any money, so we were still living with our parents. Unbelievable. Um, we're around his house, and he disappeared upstairs and then and came down shortly thereafter about an hour or so and said Andy I think you've got to come and listen to this when I've said I've written a, a Christmas number one wow, and I, I listened to it with you know jaw agape because it was oh my god that is you know that is Christmas that's the essence of Christmas yeah, it really is it was really important for Yog to write a Christmas 
number one. Yeah. To, uh, he, and he, he set himself that task. Well, he loved Christmas, Christmas as well, didn't yeah, he? he? He did. was a big yeah, fan yeah, of Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huge yeah. fan of Christmas. As you, as you know, you've yeah. been to a few of his Christmas parties. Yeah, amazing. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that was, it was a challenge for him. Because then what happened and transpired, you know, Careless Whisper came around, which was Wham! featuring George Michael. Um, it was a Wham! song, but it was like his dipping his toe into a solo career. Yeah, so as I said, what, well, Kenneth Whisper sat outside mm. of, of, of our um, concept for Wham! Yeah. So we, it was there from 1981. Yeah, it was written. One of the first, yeah. One of the first yeah, songs. Yeah, it was one of the first. Yeah. It, it was, uh, it, it's, its actual genesis was um, unique in a way because... I was messing around with chord inversions and I called Yog up and said, that I've got this really, really nice chord structure that, that I think would lend itself to a ballad. And, and yeah, we were just writing anything that, we, that, that occurred to us. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, as you do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and he came around and, and I played it to him and he said, that, I've got a melody that, that fits absolutely perfectly over that, which was the sax yep. um, melody yep. to Careless Whisper. So over the course, and that was, that was early, that would have been mid-81, I suppose. Um, and, um, you know, we, we worked it up. In fact, Shirley and I were living in Peckham at the time. And Yog was coming down to Peckham to, to, to write, to, to, to write, finish off Gary's <laughs> And he, I think he came twice and then he said, I'm not coming anymore. You're going to have to move back to me. <laughs> it's too far away from me. <laughs> oh, it was a proper slog. Yeah. So we'd had that for, at that point, three years. And, and uh, Fantastic wasn't the right album for it. Um, and Yog, uh, Yog came to me and asked me if I would um, consent to his releasing Careless Whisper as a solo track. And at that point, it was, it was clear to us both that, that Yog's songwriting would take him beyond Wham. Right. Wham was a Wham was so much about uh, us and, uh, and 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 our youth and it represented us in our youth and it was neither of us could see really how you could take Wham into maturity um, because of the nature of, of 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 what it represented and what it what it stood for. And, it, you know, Yog was going to, he was developing and evolving as an artist and as a songwriter. Mm. And his songwriting was, was, was taking him uh, into, you know, the George Michael sphere, yeah. the, sphere the, in the George Michael context as an artist. And that wasn't, that wasn't going to be Wham. And Wham imposed constraints upon his songwriting, which... You know, it would would have been wrong to have to have asked him to 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 maintain that. It couldn't, you know, as an artist, you know, it, at some point, you 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 know, you move on. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But you've always been incredibly graceful about well, the end of the band and 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 George going on to a solo career, a band that you started. You know, that your vision, your goal, and and like you say never got to tour in mainland Europe and you know it must have been hard, tough on you heartbreaking to you know to think that this well, was coming to an end it, it wasn't really because and it wasn't because we were you know I was realizing uh, an ambition um, and we were achieving success on a scale that really you know, we, we didn't imagine yeah, because, like yeah. I said earlier, you know, we imagined possibly the possibility of maybe getting a record yeah, contract, you know, yeah. oh, well, maybe having a hit single. Yeah, and, then, well, and then, it, you, you know, push the goalposts, yeah, they keep yeah. going back and back it, and back. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That. And, you know, we were both fiercely and, and, and Yog, Yog wanted, he, he wanted and needed to make Wham the biggest it could be. You know, the, essentially how we saw it as the, the biggest band, biggest pop band in the world. That, that was really important to him. And you know status and yeah. and and and, and um, the achieving of aspiration and goals, well, as you, you'll know, was really important to him. He, he right through his George Michael career, but but for him to develop, as I said, as an artist, he couldn't do that within the constraints of Wham. And we we knew that Wham would have a finite lifespan because mm. because it was it represented our youth, because it was all about that energy and vitality of youth. 
wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't going to be on stage at 60 doing banner box. Yeah, I know, I know. But it shows the strength, <laughs> I guess, of your friendship. I'm not going to ask you to try it. No, either. look, I've done it. Trust <laughs> me. I mean, it took a long time. Um, but, uh, you know, it shows the strength of your friendship, really, truly, that you could both sit down and agree that at, at its biggest, at its most successful, that you were going to call it a day. Yeah, well... And um, that you were okay with that, that you could step back and you could go, you know, well, this is what I want to do now anyway, and this is, you know, and George, off you go. It's, it's it, remarkable. It, and I only know the friends that you were after that, too. You stayed friends, you know, yeah, through yeah. it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was never going to ask him to do something as my friend that, that was... Um, that would have been purely for my, for my own self... Um, uh, my, my own purposes, so I, I couldn't. Um, but that goes against everything rock stars, pop stars well, do, because what we are inside, you know, what we want and how hungry we get and, and when you achieve success, you want more. So it, <laughs> it, 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 it the, blows my mind. Yeah, it, I, I, the thing is, I, I never really felt like that. Yeah. Um, I wanted, you know, I wanted to, to be in a band with my best mate. I mean, it's just the best story yeah. ever. It's incredible. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, they, they you, know, you know, world domination. It's crazy. Yeah. And, th and the fact is that that was enough for me. <laughs> you know, I loved the music. We, we, we made some great tracks mm. and, and it was great to, to, uh, to perform them. You know, you start a band when you're a kid to write songs yeah. and perform them. Perform. That is the only yeah, thing that matters. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I knew that very well. And, and so therefore to try to, to, to try and, uh, and, and um, leverage uh, that and what I wanted um, to get Yogg to sort of write another album. And he, he did mention writing a third album. Yeah. You know, he, uh, I think at one point he could see that um, but, but when the decision was made, and the decision was made must have been 85-ish, <coughs> probably after the, the US tour, yeah. maybe even before that, that we could see the, the end coming to, towards us, the, the closing of a chapter, you know, because mm. whilst we, we, you know, we brought the curtain down on Wham, we, it, was, it was the end of a chapter in our lives and, and, and we stepped out of it and we, and we went into the rest of our lives. It wasn't an ending for us. It was an ending of, of, of sorts. It was the ending of our youth and, mm. and, and that, that, that chapter. But it wasn't the end of us as friends and it wasn't the end of our, you know, yeah. our lives. Or, yeah, so, for sure. You know, the, I mean, the funny thing is, the final... It was such a fun day. I mean, I got stopped by the Rosas on the way to, to the... <laughs> <laughs> for for the yeah. It was a really great day. I mean, he... Uh, there's a shot of us um, backstage and he, he, has, he has become George Michael. Yeah. You know, he has... He's fully fledged. And you look at the shots from 82 uh, where he's... You know, he's just a... Yeah fairly average looking kid and he's become an amazing looking fella yeah uh, yeah and, and it's it's a remarkable transformation and um what, what a way to say goodbye i mean so you just decide let's just play wembley stadium seventy-two thousand people <laughs> invite our friends along <laughs> sing with us you know friends happen to be elton john i mean it's I, i'd have loved to have toured it and and we that was one of the few points of friction uh, between us because I felt that we we owed an obligation to our worldwide audience to 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 say goodbye to to it. But I also could understand the rationale of you know you say to me it's the final. Yeah. It's there's one final. There's only one way mm. to do it. I mean, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it, was a, it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. Can you remember that last night after playing to 72,000 people, the final gig? What were the last things you both said to each other when, when, when you parted that night? I had to leave early because I, I had a charity event the next day. But uh, yeah, yeah, Yogg said to me, um, it was actually when we were on stage and we, we embraced for the last time, he said, yeah, Andy, I, could, I couldn't have done it without you. And um, Wow. Yeah, it was a nice thing to say. We actually had decent outfits at last. <laughs> <laughs> there was a budget. Get, I mean, yeah. Uh, they, <laughs> there was a budget, yeah, yeah. 
There was a budget. Uh, I mean, it was hilarious. I mean, we, wore, we wore some shockers along the way. The, 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 oh, the I know them all. I've done them too. <laughs> I, get it. I get it. Remarkable. Yeah. I mean, well, look, we've all done that. The, the dodgy haircuts and the outfits, and but it made it made the band what it is. I mean, and the one thing that for me, my what I wish is that I had seen Wham live. You know, once, and I never got to see. It. Obviously, I see the films and the footage, but to be in the room, it's for me as a, you know, I started. I started back in 1993 um, because of, of George's voice, because of the songs that Wham have given us. And, and it's 40 years now since it all happened. And uh, it's been remarkable. What you've given us, Andrew, is, is, is nothing short of magical. So, you know, thank you from everybody, you know. Uh, and we, you know, luckily there's loads of footage and we, we can get to, you know, we can get to enjoy it and share it with our children. And, you know, I play it to my kids. I have children who are 24 and I have kids who are three. And, you know, Wham has played in the household. They get to see it. It will live forever. It's yeah, been remarkable. Thank you. It, it, it is timeless. Uh, the music itself, I think, will endure. Um, yeah. and, and hopefully Wham will... And it still appeals. I know it appeals to kids. It's got... There's something, something about Wham that... that has a, a vitality that, that and, a, and a, an exuberance that, that kids gravitate towards. Well, thank you. I couldn't have done it without you guys, so thank you very oh. much. Andrew Ridgely, it's been an, a pleasure and an honour. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.